Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we cut through the noise and speak directly to the scientists doing the latest research on how to become a faster cyclist. This episode, episode one, was recorded with Dr. Chris Minson some months ago. And as a result, you'll hear a few things that are dated, like, for example, who was the current Everesting world record holder at this time and the dates of Cape Epic. That said, the science stands true to this day, and this is a hugely helpful episode so many insights on how heat affects performance and how we can use heat training to make us faster cyclists. Uh, Thanks to Dr. Benson on this one, and we hope you appreciate this episode and enjoy it and learn a lot from it, become faster from it, and you enjoy the, the next episodes to come. Thanks everybody, enjoy. Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast, where we cut through the headlines and talk directly to the researchers to find out what their studies suggest, what they don't, and where the research is going. My name is Nate Pearson, and with me is Trainer Road's head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everyone. And we have Dr. Chris Minson of the University of Oregon. Hello. How are you doing, Chris? Happy to be here. Hi, Chris. Great. So um, we're all going to talk about the heat and performance in the heat in this podcast. Uh, Dr. Minson, why don't you first start out with your background? Sure. So um, I really kind of got into the field of exercise science because I was uh, a swimmer, um, much like Amber, but much slower than Amber. She was on one side of the pool and I was on the other side of the pool. Um, and so I really loved endurance sports. Uh, I went to University of Arizona and I started swimming there, but I wasn't uh, fast enough. So I started cycling as a pastime. So we really got into it there. Um, took two years off after that, um, decided to become a professional or try to become a professional road cyclist in San Diego. Um, again, ran into a little problem where I wasn't fast enough and that's hard thing to accept when you're trying to be fast. Um, through just kind of bumbling around, I ended up getting um, a job. Uh, I was looking, I started my master's at San Diego State University, and I'm getting hired uh, during the first Gulf War. We didn't call it that, we called it the Gulf War. Um, and I was hired basically as just a, a person cleaning rectal probes, for lack of a better term, um, for Marines who were getting ready to be shipped off to the uh, Gulf War to fight. You know, United States was prepared to fight the Cold War, and now we're shipping people off to the desert. And so we're doing what's called heat strain countermeasures. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know anything about it. But from that, I just got really into the physiology and temperature regulation. Um, And a few of my advisors there and at San Diego State said, you seem to like this and be good at it. You should think about getting a PhD. And I'm like, what can you do with that? Um, luckily I got to work with uh, a guy named Larry Kenny um, at Penn State University and he's the world expert on aging and heat stress and um, skin blood flow and so I worked with him did my PhD with him for four years and then went to Mayo Clinic uh, worked with a guy named Mike Joyner he is uh, one of the world's leading experts on uh, performance-based physiology but he's also an MD and he's also a great uh, integrative cardiovascular physiology researcher so that's what I am I'm an integrative cardiovascular physiologist with a real interest in thermal regulation. It's hired in University of Arizona, sorry, University of Oregon in uh, 2000, and I've been here ever since. And so I do both health-related research as well as performance-related research. Wow, that's impressive. So we're gonna talk directly about some of the studies that you've done, but the yeah. most interesting thing is the first blog post I ever did for Trainer Road was, was mentioning this study, Heat Acclimation Improves Exercise Performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is so funny. And now we're talking to you right now. Chris, before we get into that, I want to get some baseline for everyone is why is your performance limited in the heat for aerobic? And I'm guessing, is it limited to strength athletes too? Yeah. So the, the, in general, um, heat within a muscle can actually improve muscle performance. It increases enzymatic activities and um, a lot of other aspects, the muscle performance can improve. So really in, in strength athletes, if body temperature is really is, is elevated, that you may not see any real difference in, in performance. We see this in sprinters and others as well. Um, if their body temperature is too high, where they're actually having some, uh, have to really, really thermoregulate and they're having some other things, their sprint, their power may be, there might be some slight change, but it's pretty minimal because their bouts of exercise are so short. Once you get to longer distances, and I do a lot of work with track and field being here at uh, University of Oregon, and um, we, uh, look at people around right, right when they start hitting with 800 meters and, and beyond distances. So we're talking, you know, anything around most two to anything longer than that. And then you start seeing these small decrements in performance um, as you get hot as, with heat. The longer you go, the more you can have bigger de- deficits. 
And so um, the 10Kers, the marathoners, even the 5Ks, and certainly in cycling world, you know, most of our, there's very few except the track cyclists who are doing very extreme bouts. So the, the real thing that happens is your muscles need oxygen, right? And we deliver that through by bringing more blood to the, to the muscles. And that's why blood doping works. That's why every, every goal for a trained cyclist is to try and increase oxygen delivery to the muscles, and then we can utilize that. So anything that's pulling that oxygen away from the muscle is oftentimes going to decrease performance. So you're getting a competition between thermoregulation, getting a competition between trying to deliver more blood to the muscles, more oxygen to the muscles. Then you're going to have a competition that's going to be set up. And that's what usually decreases performance. There's mental sides of it too. Um, people don't like to be hot and uh, extremely hot and um, they feel more fatigued. It's part of our defense mechanisms to make sure we don't overcook it, right, and get injured. So there's a lot of different factors that can play in, but definitely the longer distances are going to be more affected by heat. And then what uh, happens? How does your body actually cool? Because I think this is misunderstood. Right. Yeah. So um, I think it's interesting, and I always try to explain this to my students when I'm working in my class, and that is uh, the first thing is that only 25% of the energy we create gets turned into actual work. The other 75% really is about us converting uh, all that energy usage, and it gets the byproduct is heat. So anytime you do exercise, you're going you're gonna to get an increase in body temperature, and it's going to rise. So the way we dissipate that heat is, um, is through our blood. This is the first thing that happens. We use uh, the blood perfuses our muscles. That's where in the, in the blood gets, uh, increases temperature in the muscles. That then gets carried up to our core and out to our skin. In our skin, we then have this, the interface between the, our, our body and the environment. And so we can raise our skin uh, temperature by having uh, the increase in skin blood flow. And then we have the sweating mechanism. So the important thing about sweating is that uh, it's linked to the rise in skin blood flow um, mechanistically. And we have to have evaporation of that sweat. So if you're on your trainer in your garage and you're cycling away and you're having pools of sweat dropping down, every drop that comes off did not cool you at all. You have to have that phase shift from a liquid to a gas. That takes energy. That energy comes from heat. And the heat was generated from your muscles originally. So to keep it simple, you go from the muscle generated, uh, the heat generated in your muscles, is carried by the blood to the skin, and then when the evaporation of sweat occurs, that takes that same heat and dissipates it to the environment. So how much does then just having a cool room, because I hear a lot of cyclists or runners be like, oh, it was, it was only 50 degrees in the room, so of course I was cool. Right, yeah, so um, I challenge anyone to go in a 50 degree room and then do one of your really hard uh, trainer road workouts. Um, you will be sweating, you'll be too hot, if you, unless you have no convective cooling of the, of the fan. And part of the problem with that is if you're in a, even if you're in a cool room, right, then, then the, the, at least the skin to air temperature gradient is a little better or a little more than it would be if you were in a warm room. So you got a little bit extra cooling, but you're going to create this bubble of humidity around you without having that convective movement of air across your skin to, to blow that humid air away. So you've got dry air. If you have dry air and wet skin, then you can evaporate. Humid air, wet skin, very little evaporation. So very Does this get... Does, does this get difficult then for athletes in like, uh, like 100% relative humidity, like in extremely hot environments or humid absolutely. environments? Absolutely. Absolutely. Humidity is, is the really, really hard thing for humans. Humans were, can do really well and can tolerate remarkably high temperatures, even during exercise um, in a very dry environment. As soon as it becomes more humid, then it gets much, much worse. And I've done, you know, personally done a number of races. Um, I was born in Costa Rica, so I have a real love of the country and the people. And there's a race down there, La Ruta de los uh, Conquistadores, the route of the Conquistadores. And um, I went there kind of as a heat expert and to go do the race. And the first day is known to be brutally tough. I prepared in my chamber to get ready for the heat. Um, had a couple of setbacks on that. I won't go into the details on, but I was still pretty ready. Um, I was not prepared for the humidity. Um, and absolute in the jungle on the first day, there was no air movement at all. I was going, you know, three miles an hour tops, I think, and carrying our bike to the mud for periods of time. I have never been so miserable and hot and slow in my entire life. Um, and so and that's <laughs> almost entirely because of the humidity. It's just brutal, brutal. Yeah, back so one late, I did that when I went to uh, nationals in Sartell, Minnesota. I'd never dealt with humidity, and it was crippling. My runs were, were absolutely terrible, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and then you know, later put it together. On, on the t uh, topic of 
ambient temperature. I did notice in probably the paper we'll discuss first that uh, you said 13 degrees Celsius, which equates to about 55 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimal temperature for aerobic exercise or aerobic performance. Can, right. can you explain so why that is? Sure, sure. The, um, the, the, we don't know that number exactly for cyclists. So that's a little bit of an unfair um, of us to put that in there. Why is that the ideal performance? That's really based on runners. And um, a former student of ours, Matt Ely, um, worked with uh, Mike Sock and some others. Mike Sock is a, a colleague of mine on the paper we'll discuss today. And uh, they looked at the marathon performance times. And they saw that the ideal perform across many, many athletes, many, many races, and they found that the ideal performance temperatures were around 10 to 13 degrees Celsius, so 50 to 55 degrees. And if you get too much colder than that, then people can start getting some muscle tension that develops from being a little colder, especially at the start. Um, they might have to wear more clothes. There's some in inhibiting effects of the clothes. Uh, but um, once you're getting any warmer than that, then you start having to uh, have a little bit more competition between your um, – your uh, uh, thermoregulatory ability and you having and your muscle comp, uh, and your muscle contraction in okay. those aspects. Um, so it's interesting. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, uh, trying to get uh, break the two hour marathon. And so uh, Brad Wilkins, who works at Nike, one of my former doctoral students, he, um, he was the the main physiologist to try and help. Uh, Kip Kipchoge beat this two-hour marathon for when it was a Nike project. And they dialed everything in they possibly could. And they think it was just one or two degrees higher Fahrenheit than what they thought was ideal. That might have been the difference between him being just, you know, less than a minute over the two-hour marathon and, and breaking it. it was that, that really? one or two degrees Celsius difference. Wow. So, so could, could you speculate to, I mean, will that have any impact on what we should keep an ambient temperature at if we're doing lower intensity rides? Indoors, that is? Right. So for, um, I, I still feel like um, if you have, if you're going to be biking on a trainer in a, in a room, if you can get it down below 60, you're going to be much more comfortable. That's with airflow across you as well. And because the reality is um, most people can't get a 20 mile per hour headwind on them in a, in a garage. Right. Um, and so I have one of those cheap little fans. Now you've talked about some other ones I've been meaning to get. <laughs> I need to purchase those um, for my own little training space. Uh, but is that really that balance between the temperature of the room and how much air movement you have and how humid it is in the room as well, right? My garage doesn't, is not real insulated, so it's got a fair bit of air movement, drier air can come through. But when I do it in my, when I, my wife lets me, I, I go in my uh, spare room, especially middle of winter, so I don't like being in the cold garage when it's, you know, 35 degrees in there. Um, but then by the time I'm done, the room is humid. I mean, every window has got my sweat all upon it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and so it's, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult balance to try and find that. Sure. So I just, I want to solidify this takeaway. If you're an aerobic endurance athlete and you're training inside and you are perfect, profusely sweating so that it's dripping down, you could be limiting your performance because of lack of airflow over you. And you should go and look for uh, better fans and, or to reduce the relative humidity in your room. And you can do that by usually running AC. Um, for those, I know it's very common in the U.S. to have AC in your house. And the fan that we really like is the Lasco Performance Series fan. It's an, a big, huge air blower. I get two of them on me, and it, it, it is insane um, how much air can go on. Is, uh, Dr. Minson, is that a good summary of that? It's a good summary. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And I, I do think that um, it's, it's uh, without that really high-power fan, if you're, you're going to be sweating quite a bit. I mean, even when I ride outside, I, I'm a pretty heavy sweater, and so I'll have quite a bit of sweat coming down. I wouldn't say at that point it's necessarily always limiting my performance. Um, but if I start getting a point where, wow, I'm feeling hot, then absolutely, then I'm, my performance will come down. Great. Okay, now let's talk about now uh, your study. Heat acclimation improves exercise performance. Uh, what were you trying to figure out? What was the purpose of the study? Right. So um, I don't want to go too long to have the history of this, but I'll tell you a little bit about it is I was working with an athlete, a runner, a marathoner named Dathan Ritzenheim, and he was training and preparing for the Beijing Olympics. And at the time, we thought the Beijing Olympics could potentially be the hottest marathon on record. Um, and now we've got Japan, which may also be the, <laughs> may break that record. Um, and so, we, uh, you know, when you're working with these these this level of athlete, they're absolute thoroughbreds. And so, so I was really worried about doing anything that would decrease his performance, bringing him into our lab, into our chamber, and worked very closely with his coaches. And, um, but what we're concerned about is, is, let's say we did get him really prepared for heat acclimation. 
And then we find out that through maybe hemodilution or some other factors that might play in that his performance actually went down a little bit. I would have done a terrible job as an exercise physiologist. Um, I would have been uh, very disappointed because this person spent his entire life getting ready for these moments, right? So um, we really wanted to see if we heat acclimate somebody, will we see an improvement performance? I didn't think so. Would we see no change in performance, but perform better in the heat? Absolutely. Or would we see a decrease in performance? We really want to try and nail that down. So that was a question we're trying to get at. If you look at the physiology, there's reasons why you think there might be a decrease in performance in a cool weather after heat acclimation. There could be no change or there could be an improvement. And that's what we were going after. So how did you design the study to figure it out? Yeah, so we used uh, cyclists um, partly because we can quantify so well the workload that they're doing. And with, within a environment, we can do uh, the time trials, for instance, one hour time trials to try and uh, get performance variables as well as we can uh, do it in the lab and get really good physiology data. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a exercise physiologist, but I'm also an integrative cardiovascular physiologist. So I love looking at mechanisms. I want to really understand things at a deep level. So we had to do it in, the, in, in our chamber. Um, we recruited a lot of really good cyclists, so I think we only had one Cat 3, everyone else was Cat 1 or Cat 2. We had a mixture of men and women. We got a little more men than women. We wanted to have it mixed, but unfortunately couldn't find enough women um, of that caliber who were there. Um, all the men were over, uh, VO2 max was over 65, and all the women were about 58 to 65. So we're talking good cyclists, right? They weren't elite, but they were a uh, very good couple people that could be at the national level. Um, we then designed the study um, in, in a way to try and really look at um, can we improve heat, uh, sorry, can we improve performance in cool environments and can we improve performance in hot environments? So we used a whole battery of tests before any kind of intervention. We then had the intervention which had two groups and they were randomly assigned to either uh, the heat acclimation group or the um, cool control. And then we did the whole battery of tests afterwards. And the intervention was uh, uh, 10 days. So five days, the weekend's off five days. Um, one of the key components that we want to do is make sure that people weren't just coming in and just riding for us and quitting their training. Um, the study did take a whole year. And good thing in Eugene, Oregon, where I am, the cycling races are year round. You go right from road racing to, to uh, the um, you know, to uh, the, the uh, cyclocross racing and there's that goes all through winter and they just kind of circle back around. Um, so everyone was training throughout the year and we wanted them to keep their intensity going. So one of the key components that we really said is that if, if someone comes in and just rides slower for us in the heat, we'll probably see a decrease in performance. Same thing working with the marathoners. You, we really wanted to separate out the adding the heat, so added heat benefit from the in high intensity, the key workouts. We work with the coaches very carefully to make sure, all right, what are the key workouts they're doing per week? Let's make sure they'll stay in place, make sure they're doing in the, in the best ideal cool temperatures, and then add the heat on top of that. So did, did you, you match this? Sorry, Go ahead, Chad. Did, did you match this from the, the, the experimental group to the control group that you had one athlete performing at this high, high of a level and doing this training load to the control doing a similar high performance level with a similar training load? Yes. Yep. So the, okay. um, the, all the athletes were on the same two clubs that we pulled from. And uh, so they were mostly training together. And so we made sure that we had a, had a, a good mixture from each group. We weren't like one, yes. club, one club. And so, and then, uh, then we had them all write diaries and spoke to coaches and all that kind of stuff to make sure that we, that they were maintaining those high levels of, uh, of, in, of intensity in the long, hard work, hard, you know, two, three, four, five hour rides were still in place as well. So where did you space the, uh, the, the, the heat adaption compared to the intense workouts? Right. Were they so, afterwards, same day? Yeah. So we, we, there was, as it, what kind of happens in the kind of situation is sometimes the athletes did shift stuff a little bit. We would always want to make sure that any heat acclimation we're doing was after an intense workout. So if you're going to do, an, if you do heat acclimation during the morning and then do an intense workout afterwards, you're going to be fatigued, a little more tired. You've already spent, in, in our case, an hour and a half on the bike in the heat. So we really made sure we, we had them separate as much as we could. Um, you know, that in this, so we had, you know, five days where they did the heat acclimation, the weekend off, a lot of them were racing over that weekend and then five days again. Um, and again, that was interspersed throughout the year. And we worked with them to try and find the best time as well for their schedule. If they had a really big event, we didn't want to be messing with them because that's just not, not fair to them. Um, but that was kind of the goal. And then, so the control group also did the same extra volume, but just not in a hot room. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. So they did it in the uh, 13 degree C, which is about 50, 50 degree room. Um, we had fans for both groups. 
Um, and they did, um, and this is the, one of the key components that's, that uh, we really debated about how we're gonna do this and if we made the right choice or not. In the end, um, we made a choice, whether it was the best choice or not, and that is we had them match the, the actual loads they're doing on the bike. So we had them working at 50% of VO2 max um, at, at that workload, whether they're in the heat or in the cool condition, the control condition. And uh, what that meant is that those in the heat were at a higher heart rate. So we matched the physical loads. And we're, I was doing that because at the time I was really thinking, all right, the biggest stress for these individuals is gonna be the load we're placing on their legs. And they're gonna feel the, most, the biggest fatigue for the legs. They're all highly trained at that point. They're all in, within season. And so they're all uh, very strong cardiovascular wise. So we thought, let's make sure we don't have like one group doing a lower workload um, in the chamber, even though their heart will be higher. Right. And that's become a big area of debate and actually one of the more interesting things that came out of the study that, that we didn't actually plan for. And, and, you, so kept that it, was, and you kept it at 50% VO2 max because you felt that that wouldn't confound these findings by, with an influence of actual adaptation to the training, to that, that particular training. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. We put a lot of thought into that as well. We want to have a big enough stimulus where they're going to get their body temperature up and be hot. But um, in general, if you tell you know, an athlete, yeah, you're going to spend an extra you know, hour and a half spinning on a, and you can adapt your training a little bit if need be, but um, you spend an extra hour and a half spinning at 50% of your, 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 your max watts or your peak watts, then you're, you're, the most of them are fine. They're like, oh, that sounds fine. I can do that easily. Sure. No problem. It's not going to change anything. And that value has been shown before to not really improve performance in, um, in athlete and athletes, right? If you take an untrained person, have them do, doing that, of course, they're going to adapt and get stronger. Mm -hmm. But in right. a trained athlete, you won't see any real increase over two weeks. And that for uh, all the people that understand FTP, that's about, that's an aerobic pace, 70% FTP, 65% FTP, correct? Right. Yep. yep. Right around there. Cool. Okay. So then how did you actually, okay. So they get in the, you get the people, they do some tests. Let's talk about how you tested them before we even, they even did the, um, the controls or the, the, you know, worked out in the heat. Intervention. Intervention. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, we did a, a battery of tests. So we um, really wanted to look at um, a number of performance variables and some physiological variables. So our the main things we we're looking at were VO2 max, seeing if we can improve or change VO2 max. We wanted to look at uh, lactate threshold. Um, that was the uh, kind of at that time people weren't really talking that much about FTP and uh, critical power and other things. Um, so we we focused on lactate threshold as a physiological. Uh, measurement that we can actually make. And then we had a one hour time trial and we we're looking at that as well. Um, we did some extra stuff that's not in the paper. We looked at some skin blood flow and temperature regulation uh, markers and we looked at some um, uh, leg blood flow measurements through a, a single leg kicking device. Um, we don't have to talk about all of those because we haven't, um, they're not as relevant to the performance side of things, but we had a, a pretty big battery of tests that we had that we did before and then and afterwards. And the important part really about the, the testing we did is we did it once in a cool environment and once in a hot environment. And so uh, every test we did, performance variable was, was uh, in those two environments, and we randomized across subjects which was first and which was second. For any athlete, post-testing, we kept the order the same as we did before, right? So they did heat first and then cool, they do heat first and then cool, someone cool first then heat, then we kept the same that way. It was randomized across the subjects. So the VO2 max test, I think that's pretty standard what people have seen where you put the mask on, you do a, I think I read that it was a 20 watt step test. Right. And then you measure the gas exchange. Lactic threshold, uh, I'm guessing, is that also stepped, but with blood? Exactly, yeah, yeah. it's a little different. We, it's a separate test. So, some people try and mix them at the same time, but you're usually not gonna get the best data doing that. Um, so we had a, another step test, we have longer steps between. Um, and once we got a clear increase in the, the lactate that we measured, um, then we would stop them. So we didn't make it a max test at the end. Um, you, you only went up one millimole, right? Right. One millimole from baseline, yeah. So you weren't measuring what we term as lactate threshold, which is typically maximal lactate steady state. You were just looking for a one millimole increase over baseline. Right, and we actually we actually took them a little farther than that, um, and we have a paper that looked at um, different ways to 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 look at um, the lactate threshold, different ways to calculate it. Um, there's the four millimole total, one mil step. There's you know there's the, there's the, there's the inflection point work we've done. Um, so we looked at all those different variables, but for this paper we and they all changed similarly, so it wasn't any, anything really remarkable there. But we kind of used what at the time was probably the most standard uh, approach, I think. And then the the time trial performance. This sound this is brutal. Can you describe what you made people do? 
<laughs> well, um, uh, so it was a one hour time trial. And so we basically, uh, all the, they didn't have any really feedback for them um, other than I think we gave them distance. And then we had them um, just do a, a one hour time trial. And uh, in, we did it either in a cool condition or a hot condition. And they did that both times, both before and after. Uh, you know, some of the athletes really, the ones who are stronger time trials actually kind of liked it. Um, and the, the ones that don't, hated it. Sprinters and others like that just, of course, hate time trials. Um, I will say that one thing that we could have done better, um, all the people had experienced time trials, so we felt good about that. But, um, you know, we, we subsequently done some work looking at um, different histamine blockers and um, some work by Matt Ely, and, and he's, he did a really good job making sure people did four time trials just practicing, just getting getting used to it and making sure that we could do really consistent variables, and then we added the, in, in added the, the, the uh, the control and experimental conditions. Um, this one we kind of trusted, oh, they're a really good cyclists are going to do it. But there was some pacing that we saw that happened between pre and post changes. Um, in the heat in the first one, some of the athletes went out pretty fast and they didn't realize how hot they're going to get. And so that was, that was, uh, uh, interesting but we felt like the at least in the cool cool condition which our real con, our real question was we got real consistent data um in the in the control group on that and that time trial performance it was on an ergometer so people are used to erg mode if you're a cyclist and they were just hitting intensity up or down right and then changing the wattage is that what it was yes yeah we wanted, couldn't see the wattage right no yeah we we um, wanted them to just be able to just go uh, and and use the absolute you know we didn't want them getting any cues and so it's all just in their head how hard they're going to work and how hard they're going to push and if they just have the time how long how much longer they had to do and then how did you measure their core body temperature because i saw that in the paper too this right is crazy yeah <laughs> so this is this is something that always gets a lot of debate um you know we've used the industrial pills in the past and some people like those but those are at a minimum 45 dollars per pill um, so, and sometimes they don't work that well. So, um, we use a classic way, which is a rectal temperature. And, um, the way I explain this is to athletes who come through and, and the way I explain it to any cyclist, you know, um, God or evolution or whoever gave us this wonderful bum crack. And it was designed specifically so you can ride a bike with a rectal probe. So we're basically just using human evolution to put some real good science forward. The crazy part is I read that it was five centimeters, which to me seems like was no, was it 10 cent? How much was it? 10 centimeters, yeah. 10 centimeters, which seems like a lot. Uh, I don't it know. Does. So. Yeah. It's actually, you know, the funny thing is, it's, um, and I, I think, um, women in general are more comfortable with their bodies, um, than men are. And so the women never bad an eye really about rectal probes. The, the other than there's some embarrassment, I think walk around, here's the, here's my rectal probe, you know, and it's coming out of your shorts. Um, but the men have a little harder time with it. I think which is not as men in general, not as comfortable with our bodies. Um, and you tell them how far it needs to go and you show them and they're like, ah, but honestly, it's, you don't, once you're sliding it in, there's a little bulb that we, the bulb that has to go through, um, to help hold it in place, has to go through the anal sphincter. Um, it's not bad. And if you've ever done uh, esophageal, we do esophageal temperature as well. That goes up the nose, down the throat, um, mm. down the, you know, and that into the esophagus, um, that's miserable. You're gagging reflex, all that kind of stuff. But, um, the rectal probe is once you're moving, it's not bad. How did, uh, how did you control for things like, like what if they had a bunch of caffeine that day or something like that, that could increase their performance? Yeah, we had, we made sure they kept, uh, food, uh, diaries and they followed them every single day. Um, you know, I'm sure you're probably somewhat familiar with this from the athletes you speak to, but the majority of them are pretty regimented what they do, especially those who are training for big events. They're pretty good about, you know, start telling them to document things. Um, they're, they're, they're fine doing that to pretty much have a certain amount of foods that don't bother them. They eat certain times. Um, we try to have them not have any caffeine on the testing days and, you know, a big debate in my field and, and something I have some ideas that'd be kind of fun to do a study on is to take regular caffeine, caffeine drinkers and have them not have caffeine for a day and see how their physiology changes. Cause there will be some changes. Um, but I think once people are going in the lab, that kind of goes by the wayside. No one complained of headaches or other things, um, but we did try and minim uh, uh, make sure the food, the diet, the exercise, everything they did pre in, in any pre or post testing was identical, the same. That's awesome. So what were the results? Yeah, so the, the main thing that we saw is that um, there are two parts to it. One is we knew or really suspected we see real improvements in the performance of variables in the hot condition, meaning heat acclimation worked. So in the so heat acclimation worked very well. So improvements in the heat, uh, all the heat uh, tests in the experimental group, control group, we saw no changes. 
Um, but what's surprising is we saw um, VO2 max increase, lactate threshold improve, and improve time top performance in the cooler condition. And uh, they were on the order of, across subjects about two to seven or eight percent increases, which was, um, and it wasn't 100 percent everybody, but it was pretty close. We published our individual data so people can see who the true responders and non responders are. Um, and uh, almost nearly every athlete improved in the cool weather performance. That's crazy. And looking at your results, the VO2 max went up a lot, like in the cool and the hot, like what, five <laughs> points, maybe? No, four points. Three, yeah, three or four. Yeah. Which no. is insane. People like train for, what, a season for that, don't they? Right, yeah. Um, they, and that was one of the interesting parts, and that's why we were a little bit um, unsure to make sure that if what we had done was, was fair or accurate or other things. And this is where some of the debate has come in, and that is, you know, um, these individuals were, like I said, cat one, cat two, and one or two cat threes. Um, so very good cyclists, and we still saw those improvements. Um, I think... Uh, and, and part of the VO2 max had the, had the bigger um, controversy. We, we kind of started with that. Um, we're not the only ones to see that. Others have seen that as well, um, usually not on that, on that magnitude. Um, but part of the thing is that um, we match people for workload. So those individuals were working, spending you know, 90 minutes, five days in one week for two full weeks um, at a higher heart rate and a little higher intensity. And so we think there is some training effect in with the heat benefit effect as well. So the, we can step back and say, well, then your study wasn't valid. Well, I would love to, we can't, we couldn't isolate just the heat. A way that we could do that is in, in a lot of number of studies have done this subsequently, where what you do is you, rather than match for the same workload, you have them match the same cardiovascular strain. You have them, you have the, the, the heat group will work at a lower absolute intensity or workload, but then their heart rate is going to be matched. So you, pick whatever value it's gonna be and say this athlete 150 is what we wanna see, 150 heart rate in both. Well, the workload in the hot condition is gonna be less, right? And so we just have a higher workload. So they, they worked, so I, I believe that some of that heat benefit was a training effect. And so, I, go ahead. Go ahead. So I'll say that was, that was one, of the, one of the early criticisms we got and we said we knew that, we knew that might be the case. But when I'm working with an athlete, if they're looking for any kind of performance benefit, and we want to make sure they can be prepared and perform well in the heat, then we want to get them heat acclimated, full stop. We now know, and this has been shown time and time and time again, that there, if it's done right, and you can do it wrong, but if it's done right, there's no negative performance benefits to heat acclimation. Never seen anything. Again, you can over fatigue, you can de over dehydrate. Those, if you do it wrong, you, if you skip your intense workouts, um, you know, then you're going to have decreases in performance or maybe no increase in performance. But if you do it right, there's always a benefit in the heat. Um, for some athletes, adding heat, whether it's uh, physiological to the heat benefit or whether it's an, a different training stimulus for them, there is some training benefit and performance benefit. I don't think we covered it. In the hot condition, that was 104 degrees Fahrenheit. But how long did you do it for? So they were in um, each, each session. Uh, there were going to be 10 sessions total. Each session was 45 minutes, 10 minute rest, 45 minutes. So it was an hour and a half plus 10 minutes. So really an hour, 40 minutes, right? Um, a total of heat exposure five times a week for two weeks. I, I can tell you looking at trainer road zone data and looking at your results, if we added two athletes, like who are, who are doing, let's say Baxter, which is 0.65 for 90 minutes of like percent of FTP, and we increase it to like a tempo workout. And they did that, what was it, five times a week? They're like, you're, you're getting watts per kg increase of like 0.2. Like that's, no, it's not just that, right? Like we, we would throw that in all day long if we're going to increase your VO2 max mm -hmm. by three or four by just adding some tempo rides, increasing from your aerobic rides. Uh, we have a very huge data set. And I can tell you that that is, in, at least in my mind, I am pretty confident that it is not just the added heart rate um, to your results. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And one of, so one of the big things, and this is why I really like the fact that, you know, we have uh, here at University of Oregon, we have just fantastic facilities. Um, we're going to be moving my lab soon into the new um, uh, world uh, class stadium we're going to have for the new holding, holding hosting the, um, our, our Hayward field is, is, has been destroyed. The, our classic, you know, facility is it's gone. We have this incredible world class uh, 
track and field stadium um, to help host the world championships next year. And my lab's going to be integrated in with that um, with two of my, my colleagues. Um, so we have great facilities here. We've got some of the best techniques to look at it. And one of the, the one of the big physiology things that we saw, physiological change we saw, we saw a change in, in, in maximal cardiac output. That's the only way I can explain that that VO2 max went up, right? And so the question becomes, well, how do you, how, in these well-trained athletes, how did you get a, a, an increase in, in uh, uh, cardiac output? Um, and, and to take one step back, you know, um, the reason why things like blood doping and other things work is because we're improving the oxygen delivery to the working muscle in endurance performance. That's really the only thing you can do that's really going to improve true performance very quickly. And that's why like all these athletes have, have focused on the red blood cells. Um, another way of doing that is to increase your cardiac output and, uh, your max heart rate, your peak heart rate, that's not going to change. You really don't change that much at all. The only thing you can change is stroke volume. So the question becomes, how do you change stroke volume? We know that with, um, when someone exercises, an untrained person starts training, one of the real big things happens are they're changing the blood flow back up to their heart. That creates a little more, uh, that over time creates a little bigger, uh, left ventricular chamber. Um, there's this, uh, so you, so the volume overloading basically, which takes time and you get a little bigger chamber that gives you for every beat, you get a little bigger stroke volume. And so what we think is because we had these people remain really well hydrated, um, during their um, heat acclimation protocols. Um, they were doing a lot of this heat training. Um, we saw a pretty consistent, very, very good, but not overwhelming increases in plasma volume, that they were training now with higher blood volume. And we think that caused some little, little bit increase in the stroke volume, and that resulted in increase in cardiac output. So all the groups that have kind of, no one's done the cardiac output as well as we can. The, the, I won't go into the technical details of how we do it, but it's a non-invasive way, it's the gold standard non-invasive way to look at cardiac output. Um, there's other ways that are easier to go, but they're they're not as good. And Chris, can I ask a or Dr. Mintz, can I ask a quick question? Chris, fine, yeah. when, when you talk about improved cardiac function, I've seen studies where they attribute that to not a change in the volume of the left ventricle, but a change in the muscle thickness, so the greater pumping capacity. Does that does sure, one typically take place over the other? Or do they happen concurrently? How does that work? They kind of they kind of happen concurrently. Yes, and there's been some great work by um, uh, a woman who doesn't do performance physiology. Uh, Mikhail Horowitz has looked at some of the isoform changes in the muscle um, that happens with heat acclimation, and that may have some better contractility. Um, what happens is um, it's kind of the law of Laplace, and so if you have um, the the wall tension is a function of the diameter of your chamber, and so if you start increasing the volume of that chamber, then the wall in order to maintain wall tension uh, appropriately, you have to have a thickening of the uh, ventricle. So we know that as, as people endurance train, and it's, not, it's, it's debatable whether strength training does this or not, but with endurance trained athletes, you're almost always gonna see a thickening of the left ventricle. So what that does is, is, is maintain the wall tension so the, the left ventricle is getting overstressed during contraction, you can still have a full contraction, um, but it's also um, uh, 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 allowing you to have to maintain a, the, the, the full end diastolic volume is what you have at the end of filling of the heart and, and, and systolic volume is the end of contraction. So if you have the ability to have a full contraction, but you've increased the end diastolic volume, now you've got a bigger stroke volume, the difference between the two. Okay, thanks. That wasn't the best explanation. From, no, sorry, that's but, really good. That good. clarified yeah. a lot of things for me, thank you. Good, sure, yeah. So basically you're, what's happening, what you think is that the heart is beating more blood for every beat. And yes. that is then increasing the aerobic or the oxygen in your system that you can then use to go faster. Yes. In, in those athletes and under those <clears throat> testing conditions. Yes. Okay. So um, since we're on the topic of physiology, maybe you can clarify one more thing. So I understand that with heat acclimation, one of the big changes that enhances performance is that we get this increase in plasma volume, but as plasma volume increases and, and that means we have more blood volume and therefore the potential to have greater cardiac output don't we still have the same number of red blood cells in the same amount, maybe not the same concentration, but the same amount of hemoglobin and therefore the same oxygen carrying capacity? So I don't understand how more watery blood would translate to greater oxygen delivery to the muscle. If this, right. It seems like that this, the amount of oxygen should be the same. Is that, where am I, where am I, where am I missing there? No, so you're, you're spot on, Chad. And that was the original concern we had working with Dathan, Dathan Ritzenheim. When you look at it and you say, okay, we might, create an increase in plasma volume and therefore have a reduction in the hematocrit, um, then that's really the percentage of red blood cells you have in your sample of blood. 
but that's also the number of red blood, percent of red blood cells for any cardiac output. So take a high level athlete, really high level athlete, they might have a cardiac output of, of at a very high values be 40, right? 40 liters per minute. Um, and so that means that in one minute at max cardiac output, they're going to have 40 liters of blood circulating, and I should use better, 40% of that would be red blood cells approximately, right? Um, so if you heat acclimate, that number might come down a little bit. And so your, your question is spot on. Would you have, you, now you're delivering less blood, red blood cells for that given cardiac output. So, but what we saw was an increase in cardiac output. So now if you say we got a slightly uh, more dilute blood, if you will, but you have an increase to 43, 44 liters per minute, now you're delivering more red blood cells per minute basis. Got it. Right? And, and that's what it was going to be. So essentially every beat you're getting a little more, more red blood cells, but we measure it per, per minute basis and you're getting a, a few extra liters of circulating blood. So, so that's a, a, it's a difficult concept to try and to wrap our mind around. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure that out, but that's, that's what we observed and a few others have seen that as well. Got it. Thank uh, you for that. Yeah, that's awesome. I've always wondered that too. Uh, cyclists and runners, we care a ton about weight, right? And we've talked about increasing plasma volume. And I think it was interesting about how much weight did these people gain um, in the intervention group? Wow. So um, I don't actually remember the exact. I, I know it's 200 milliliters. So a little less okay. than half a pound. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I couldn't remember exactly. I was going to go back and say, well, how much was the plasma volume expansion? Was that weight change? Um, and so, yeah, we care a ton about weight. Um, but at the end of the day, that is not really going to be a huge performance benefit. I mean, you take any high level cyclist and you say, if I take a half pound away from you, would you prefer that? If I say, I'd like to take, make your bike a half pound lighter, would you like that and performance increase? Then there's there, then absolutely there's going to be this incremental improvement improvement in performance and and you know Nate, i've heard you talk about how you were if you had done something different you had could win by two seconds more you would have taken it and you would have taken first versus second or something like that and yeah. there's a lot that goes into actual performance on the line of course right um but when someone's doing a, a, a an hour time trial um especially on a flat course the weight's not going to make a difference even on hilly courses a half pound versus having a higher cardiac output i'll take the higher cardiac output any day yeah these well your results show it too with the lactic threshold improvements the watt kg totally worth the extra water weight in every single situation even on this like a 10 percent climb if you're everesting this would still be better for you than worrying about the plasma increase that, that also, actually that actually brings up another physiology question i mean if you're if you're experiencing hemodilution greater plasma volume wouldn't that just dilute the lactate levels does that mean they can tolerate more lactate because per blood volume there's less lactate in there so they can generate more lactate how's that work yeah, that's a great question. And so the, um, in the blood, yes, you're absolutely right. You can dilute it a little bit. Um, but what's circulating the blood isn't really what's going to be de decreasing performance. And, and, and um, Chad, again, I think you, in train, you at Trip Guys Trainer Road, I'm huge fans of you guys because you do such a great job with the science. I'd say 98% of things, I'm in complete agreement with what you say, awesome. right? You do a really, really great job. And that's more than what's, I can say. Very good. What's the two? You <laughs> yeah, got to the two percent. Yeah. Yeah. Email us and we'll fix it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Things I'm like, mm, let's try to think about that. So um, uh, we can talk another time about some of the things. Yeah. Some of the whether recovery is good or not good is one thing. Uh, sorry, not recovery. I'm sorry. After you do a workout, if there's a, a cool down period, is is beneficial or not? I have some thoughts about why it is. And, and oh, let's uh, definitely talk about that. Okay, cool. we'll talk not, about it later. Not today, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure, be be fun to, to talk about that. Um, um, so, uh, so you're going to get some, so, so, um, you know, lactate is not what, and even the hydrogen ion produced from lactate is not what's causing the decrease in performance. It's simply a marker of what, what's happening to the metabolic state of our muscle. And so if it's, if it's getting diluted dilute a little bit more in the plasma, that doesn't matter because it's not even, I mean, it's, it's lactate is actually a fuel source for our heart and for some other things. And so it's, so it's, it's just a marker what's happening in the muscle. So if we're diluting a little bit more, um, we're not diluting the fluid in the muscle where it really matters and where, where we're going to be having this potential detriments in, in performance. Did I also see that there's some glycogen sparing that happened with the heat group too? Yeah, so we didn't, we didn't exactly measure that, um, but others have measured that in the past. And uh, again, this is a bit debatable. Um, and I think it comes down to, is there some benefit? There's some, if you look at the mechanistic path, pathways, there is some potential benefit for um, heat acclimation to improve uh, the glycogen sparing. I think it's also a part of the training effect. So a lot of the early studies, they had some, especially doing untrained people, um, you might see some training effect. 
And then we know that training has glycogen sparing, right? That's, that's been demonstrated a thousand times over. So again, I think it's a nuanced effect. So if you take away the training effect, there's probably some slight benefits um, to, the, to, the, to the carbohydrate sparing. Um, and that may be also partly because of performance and then lactate thresholds down. So you're not having to be um, so glycolytic as you would be otherwise, oxidative glycolytic. Do we, um, so what are the takeaways? Can we do this year round? What if we stop doing it? How long do the, the benefits last for? Or do we know that? Great question. I get so excited about this question. So um, uh, I get this question a lot, right? Um, and so the, the, the way we kind of think about it, and Julian Perard and some others, in, uh, he's in Australia now, has done some really great work on this, um, Sebastian Racinus. Um, um, and they've shown that um, for every two days you take off, not doing any kind of heat stress, you lose about one day of heat acclimation. So if you have a 10-day heat acclimation protocol, right? If you don't do anything at all, then by 20 days later, you've pretty much lost most of the benefit of that heat acclimation. That's not doing any more heat acclimation, not really doing any, any, any more, more real training. Um, we know that just exercising, you're going to raise your body temperature up, you're going to actually get some benefit of heat acclimation. So any, any well-trained endurance athlete has some level in, of, of heat acclimation already. So the question becomes, what's the minimal dose we can have to maintain these benefits longer term? Um, whether it's heat stress or a high intensity workout where your body temperature gets really high. We don't have that answer very well. But I can tell you that if you've got, you know, 10 day heat acclimation protocol, you've got maybe 20 days after that to maintain that. If every week you do one or two extra bouts um, in the heat, low level heat and maintain your intensity, you can maintain that benefit longer for sure. It will gradually come down a little bit, um, but it'll find a new plateau. And that's what we do a lot with the duck athletes I work with, uh, the, um, you know, the world championships recently last year and supposedly this year as well. Um, thank you, COVID. Um, we're in Austin. And you've got all these athletes coming in, in you know, early June and trying to compete. And Austin can be very, very hot. And so, um, but the tapering period is really, really important. You don't want to fatigue people. You don't want to really change things. So we get them started weeks in advance um, of doing the heat acclimation. And then we kind of maintain these, these fewer, fewer doses of heat um, uh, as we come up to their competition. Um, but the question you also asked was about, should we, doing this, should we, we be doing this year round? And one area of, of uh, uh, that I do some work with athletes that I never publish, um, call it our secret sauce, if you will, or other things that we do. Um, I'm willing, but I'm, I wouldn't tell anybody this, but I'll tell you guys. Um, so one of the things that we, I've worked with, um, we worked with like national caliber uh, track and field athletes and some um, uh, people doing uh, high altitude training camps and other things the live high train low they're doing sometimes and they get these, they over time certain athletes will get, you know, this, this performance boost by having increased red blood cell mass. The problem is the reality is sometimes they can't compete for a month after that. So they come back down their back at low altitude, lower altitude, and a lot of those benefits can trickle away. So we're, what we've been doing is, is after they come back from their heat altitude camps, we then have them start doing heat acclimation. It's usually passive heat acclimation, so they're not exercising the heat. We're just putting them in a hot tub and letting them sit there for uh, 45 minutes to an hour, three to four times per week. And we do that while they are um, uh, while they're getting ready and kind of sitting around and still training for their big event. Um, what we found, and um, I think there's going to be some papers coming out on looking at this pretty soon, is that uh, we can I'll, – I'll, I'll, Clarify that here in a second. Um, uh, what we found is we can maintain their red blood cell mass longer if they include heat acclimation protocol afterwards than if they don't do that. And the reason why is because both hypoxia and heat acclimation both can activate this, this protein called um, HIF1 alpha, hypoxia induced factor 1 alpha, which is the thing we can measure in the blood and it's the thing that really gets increased to stimulate erythropoiesis, increased red blood cells. So heat acclimation seems by adding that on afterwards, we can actually maintain those uh, HIF1 alpha levels and therefore the maintain the red blood cell mass longer. And that's been a real benefit for some of the athletes I've, I've worked with. There is another side to this, this part where, where I think there's going to be some new data coming out. Um, and I'm a big believer in this. I'm going to go back to Mikhail Horowitz, Horowitz's work. Um, she uses mostly animal models for her work. And, um, but she's shown that there's this adaptations that occur in the first few weeks of heat acclimation, right? And they're autonomic and they're, there are some other aspects to it, but the real cellular adaptations take longer to, for that to, to come in place. And laws have to do with the heat shock proteins. That's where her area has been, which are these specialized proteins in all of our cells and, and upregulate them with a lot of benefits. Um, 
And uh, what she has shown is that uh, if you heat acclimate longer, you get a lot of these cellular benefits you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, and so we're starting kind of now looking at how we can get athletes to do, to make heat acclimation a more regular part of their training regimen. Um, and there's uh, some evidence, certainly from our labs, and I've talked to some others, and I think one or two groups might be getting ready to publish this, that are showing some increase in red blood cell mass just by adding long-term heat acclimation on the order of five, six, seven, eight weeks of heat acclimation. Wow. Um, so what I try and do personally now, and um, I have my own varying degrees of this because I'm human at the end of the day and kids and life and all that, um, I try and still get some heat acclimation um, in, into my body um, regularly. Um, and I think there are some real benefits to that. And uh, whether or not it's I'm doing enough to increase my red blood cell mass over what it would be otherwise, um, I haven't seen that. I haven't looked really either. But um, on the few times I have, it seems to be pretty stable. Um, but I think this, I think athletes, I know you're at trainer road, you guys are doing some of this. Now you have a sauna there and you're, um, uh, for instance, preparing for Cape Epic. The best thing you can do is not wait till a month before and start heat, heat acclimation. Yeah. You can get some benefit and be important to really make sure you're heat acclimated as best you can by that time. If you start earlier, like you have been, make it a regular part of your training. Those can be some benefits. that will make a real big difference. It's happening today. Uh, it's starting today and we're like yesterday for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that, that's my next question. Um, for those athletes that don't have a heat chamber and they can't put a bike in it or they don't have a hot tub or it's like for us, Cape Epic is in March. It's going to be cold here and we can't go outside and do this. Um, we've talked before about kind of after you're ramped up after a workout to go into a sauna afterwards, can that get similar benefits? Can we use a, sa a sauna? Yes. There's been without some a bike. Without a bike, yeah. So, so if you have a way to get hot afterwards, even just a really hot bath, and you can sit in it long enough, um, do your performance, do your, 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 get your, your body temperature up, and then try to extend that body temperature up. And again, Chad's talked about this before and done a great job with this, saying, you know, the, the longer you keep that body temperature up and the higher, the, better, the more benefit you're going to get, provided you're not getting fatigued and dehydrated and all that kind of stuff. So there is some benefit. No one's really looked at this point whether that passive heating can um, really um, improve performance um, in high level athletes, the untrained, medium trained, maybe, but, but high level athletes, I consider all you guys to train a road for sure in that category. We're not talking the elite, right? Even the leaders are a special animal. Um, but the really high level athletes, um, uh, we don't know for sure if it would, if it would improve, uh, like performance in cool environments, other things, but definitely will help you maintain the heat acclimation benefits for sure. The other thing people can do is, and again, I know, I know, um, you, you guys at trainer road have speaking about this before, and that is, you know, you can make your room hot. I mean, or you just don't have a fan on, decrease the fan. We uh, published a study looking at the um, uh, overdressing. So we use runners in that case, um, so we're, so we're working with primarily at uh, University of Oregon, and we had a lot of the athletes overdressing and seeing if we can get heat acclimation. It's not as good as being in a hot room and performing in hot environments and all those types of things, um, but overdressing can also work. And, you know, if someone doesn't have, well, I don't have a heart rate monitor, I don't, most people do, but I don't have uh, core temperature measurements. If you think of zero being, I'm totally thermoneutral, I'm just perfect temperature, you know, um, absolutely comfortable. And 10 being like, this is the most hot, miserable I've ever been in my entire life, surface of the sun type thing, right? We want people around a seven. So pretty hot. So where they're, if they're, whatever you're doing, if you get to the point where like, wow, I'm pretty hot and I'm sweating and, and I can really feel it, um, but I'm not miserable. That's kind of the target we want to get people to. That gets you to about this, these, these critical thresholds where we know heat shock proteins are going to be increasing or at least stabilizing and staying up. Um, we're going to see some of the, the maintenance or increasing the plasma volume changes. Um, we're going to see some other, other good benefits that, 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 that are go along heat acclimation. So that's kind of the target we go for. So in the case of that 7 of 10 rating, does it really matter how you go about it? I mean, an infrared sauna versus a dry heat sauna versus a sauna or a hot tub bath, et cetera? It doesn't really matter. No, no. Um, there, I think as, as, as research continues for the elite and the very high level athletes, there might end up being some kind of differences. Um, for instance, if you're in a sauna, you've got um, what's coming back to your heart is less blood because it's, it's, it's more in your skin and your periphery. But if you're in a hot tub, the compressive force of the water at your lower limbs is helping maintain your uh, the return of blood to your heart. No one's really compared the two, especially in the athletic population. Say, well, is sitting in a sauna versus sitting in a hot tub better? Um, hard to know at this point. Um, from a performance standpoint, I think from a left ventricular remodeling thing, possibly a hot tub is better um, because you're getting that 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 
the increased cardiac output plus the increased volume load, um, similar to what we get with exercise and muscle pump. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't really matter, I think, as long as from the heat acclimation benefit, getting your temperature up and getting comfortable is, is, is really what people need to do. Looks like we're getting a hot tub, Chad. Pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, so let me say this back to you. <laughs> if you are, yeah, it's sports performance. It has to happen. Uh, so if you're a runner, um, you might put on extra clothes around the treadmill because it's very hard to move that treadmill around. But if you are a cyclist, one thing that we've recommended, and I want your opinion on this, is you could go into your bathroom, turn the heat up a bunch, like turn off the fans, uh, turn the hot shower on. It raises the humidity a bunch because we're trying to limit the evaporative cooling. And uh, it, might get hard, it might be hard to raise your bathroom to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius. But if you put your trainer in there and you exercise with no fan, could we maybe get to that 7 in a lower temperature room, but because the humidity is so high and there's no evaporative cooling, we're still getting the same benefit? Um, the short answer is yes. You'll still get a lot of the benefits from having a high body temperature, absolutely. Um, the, the thing I try and really emphasize to athletes, and again, this is where I made my own mistake going into uh, La Ruta, um, and that is uh, we really want people preparing in any way they can for the environment they're gonna go to, right? So if someone's gonna be training in a very hot, humid environment, and they're going to go into a hot, um, dry environment. Um, the high humidity does change um, the sweat gland output. That um, how the sweat adapt, sweat gland itself actually adapts. So um, in general, even if someone's going to go to a high humidity environment, we want doing we want them doing some of their heat acclimation in a dry environment to really maximize these benefits as far as the sweating uh, and and sweat gland function. There's a, it's a process called hydromyosis. And, and um, what it is, is, is you get a decrease in sweat gland function um, when, it, when the skin is really, really wet. So if you're in a high humid environment, the sweat glands actually might, you're still gonna be sweating a ton, losing a lot of water, but the sweat gland output itself is may, maybe downregulated a little bit locally mm. at the sweat gland level. So the short answer, heat acclimation, you'll feel a lot better if you do it exactly the way you said. If you're gonna be going competing in a really dry environment, ideally we'd want the athletes you can do a little bit of humidity work. We really want them doing most of their work in a dry environment. Uh, so we could go into our dry or infrared sauna and do this. I think, I think ours is big enough, Chad, to do a wheel off uh, like feedback sports trainer. Probably. Uh, this, is, this is just my personality. If 104 degrees Fahrenheit is good, this thing goes up to 150. <laughs> is 150 better or should I keep it down low? Is it, will there be too much stress on my system and maybe impact further intensity if it's really hot? Yeah, so there's actually a lot to unpack there, and this is something I'm glad you brought this up because um, I've heard some, uh, I think Jonathan in particular had, gets, really doesn't like the heat or something, and you hear these numbers, he's like, oh my gosh, that's so hot, I would never do that, right? So let's clarify some temperatures here. Um, uh, in the hot tubs, we used about 100 to 104 degrees, right? Remember, that's, that's water on your skin, so you don't have really, you have no evaporative cooling at that point, and there's direct um, conduction of heat from the water to your skin. So that raises your skin temperature, and that affects how hot you feel. You have this body temperature, this high skin temperature, you're going to feel really hot. This body temperature, this skin temperature, you're not going to feel very hot. So um, uh, we can really, one reason why I use water is because it's such a great conductor of heat that we can really clamp people's body temperature and have them in or out of the water to get them to a certain threshold you want to get them to for body temperature or, or thermal comfort, right? We use about 104. Um, if you're in a far infrared sauna, the, the way that far infrared sauna works is it sends these, you know, electromagnetic waves basically and heat the muscle up from within, right? So um, the absolute temperature from that is a little bit less important because it's, the room can be very hot, but they may range from 120 to 150. The important thing about the far infrared saunas is, is that you want to get in as they're warming up, right? So that's when the infrared is coming in, it's, it's heating. Once they get to their highest temperature, they're going to cycle on and off the infrared heaters so 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 they don't get too hot so you want to be in while it's warming up so if it's 120 130 140 it doesn't really matter as long as you're a comp you're you're, you're in that seven range okay i'm hot i'm not miserable um but that's gonna be a lot lower temperature now if you move to a dry finish sauna that's very different that's dry air no infrared low humidity when you talk about um, steam rooms this you're at this point right um People can comfortably, even Jonathan, can get ready to where he is comfortable in 180 80 degrees Fahrenheit in a dry sauna. 
They're always made out of wood. You can literally, I've been to some that have been up to 220 degrees, so boiling point, right? You can actually put a metal plate down and fry an egg on while you're in there, right? Um, that's why they're out of wood and you always bring a towel because anything metal, you're going to burn yourself really easy at those temperatures. But it's dry. So sitting in a 160, 170, 180 degree dry sauna doesn't feel very hot at all. You can get hotter um, in an infrared sauna at 120, 130 if you're getting blasted with, uh, not blasted, sounds unhealthy, but you're getting, you're, you're in the infrared waves. Right. And then would you recommend also a, uh, a fan then in the sauna while you're working out? Because I think you said your study did that. Is that correct? We did that just for um, to making sure that they could maintain the workloads, not get overheated. So again, it depends on what your goal is. So I think that um, in general, a fan across is, is actually tends to be a good thing because it helps with our evaporative cooling. And if the, we don't want the skin getting so wet that we're having that, that hydromyosis where we're having this decreases in, in um, sweat gland output function. Um, but oftentimes it's about comfort. And so uh, if you want to maximize your time there, you got to find that balance between, okay, I'm hot enough, I'm not too hot, and now I can maximize my time in that, in that. And something you mentioned before, you know, if someone's getting in, and there's, you know, we're talking high level athletes, they always think two things. One, more is better. And two, I could have done more work. I could have gone every VO2 max test athlete for someone says, I could have gone five more seconds. I'm like, you were about ready to zing off the back. You know, a person back there was nervous getting ready to catch you. You were at your limit. You couldn't have gone any farther. And I, I had two more seconds, right? And so working with athletes is really always very interesting. And, and people have to be really careful. And again, you guys, Trainer Rhodes, have done a great job with this. There's the mental fatigue, the physical fatigue, the sleep, um, the, you know, make sure you get your, 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 your really separate your high intense workouts from your lower intensity workouts. That stuff is critical to any athlete being successful. Heat's the same way. If you're disrupting any of that, then you're better off not doing heat acclimation unless you're going to compete in hot environment, right? Get that stuff really, really set down well. And then, and so if you're going out there and just making yourself exhausted, so the next day or two days, your workouts suffer, you're doing it wrong. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chad. Okay. So hypothetical situation, um, an athlete's eight weeks out from say Cape Epic and is going to get in the sauna and maintain that seven out of 10, uh, discomfort level. How long should each of those, uh, sauna sessions be? Yeah. So if, I, mean, I don't know how many days you're going to be doing each week and whatnot, but we usually try and get people in there for an hour um, minimum. Okay. Um, and the, I, the, the classic numbers were to do, um, uh, an hour and 20 minutes of that kind of heat. Um, and so, but that for me is, is people who are not already heat acclimated by being an athlete already. Um, mm -hmm. and so in general, more is better as long as it doesn't fatigue you too much. So, but I'd say a minimum would be an hour to be in there. Um, but if someone's getting overcooked and too hot, um, then, uh, then it's not doing them the benefit. They need to kind of gradually build up, up to that. And I like the idea of you saying starting eight weeks out. Um, that's, that's so much better than saying, I mean, invariably I get, you know, I, my phone goes off. Every time I see an event getting hotter than it's predicted, my phone starts going off hook up saying, all right, it's a week out. I need to heat acclimated. What do I do? And yet one or two bouts helps. You can see some little benefits and remarkable ability for us to adapt to heat. And so with one or two bouts, you get some improvement. Some studies have shown this three to five day window, you can get some benefits, but it's not fully maximized until minimum of 10 exposures. Um, and then, uh, and anything benefit past that, I think is going to be even better. And Dr. then that hour, hour 20 per session, how many times a week? I don't know if I mentioned that or you mentioned that. Yeah, I didn't mention that. No, um, they were usually saying like four to five times per week. Okay. Um, and this is really trying to maximize the benefit, right? Okay. Um, and, and to try and do it in a, in a fairly tight window. Um, I think if you do fewer, especially if you're, if you're still doing your intense workouts, which at eight weeks out, you are still doing a lot of that, right? Then I think you need to find that balance um, of how much heat you're adding and not disrupting your your faster workouts. Okay. Um, I, I spoke to some people at runner's world a while back and one of the off the cuff of guys says, Oh, so a uh, train cool taper hot. I was like, no, you, uh, mm, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> right. So if you've done nothing else, if you really need to separate those out then train in the cool environments. And when you come to taper, it's long enough, you can add some heat. I definitely think you should add some heat at the, as you in, in intersperse in some of those inner workouts. But the point is still separate those out as best you can to make sure you're okay. maximizing performance benefits from your training and everything else, and then adding the heat. Uh, so I'm not totally clear on this point, and then we're, we'll wrap it up. But uh, the best would be to actually do some aerobic work in the heat, 
Second best would be to do these, these sessions either afterwards or for an hour independently. Is that, is that correct? If you could, like, if you could choose, yeah. And would, could you do a combo of the two as long as it didn't impact your intense workouts? Absolutely. Yeah. Again, the more heat you get and the more regular you get it, the more, the more you're going to actually benefit and adapt to it. So just think about it in the, well, the longer you're up at that seven range, the more time you spend at that and the more often you spend at that, the more you're going to have some adaptation or maintain those benefits. Right. Um, but I, again, I do think that there's, there's a huge psychological component to it as well. Um, and when we first published our paper, uh, some people said, oh, that's all mental. I'm like, well, but the phys- <laughs> that's not all mental. But there's no doubt that, um, and this happened last year working with these athletes um, who went to Austin for the NC2A championships, the U of O athletes. Um, the coaches, we had brand new coaches at, at Oregon, and you know, we have a huge history of, of track and field. And so there's a lot of pressure on the coaches. And so I was working with new coaches and they were a little bit nervous. And like, you know, we had, we had, they had to compete in Tucson and then then Sacramento and then, and then um, Austin. And they were really worried about the heat acclimation and what's going to happen. We started really early. Did it, we did really, I think a really good protocol for them. They had some total breakout performances. So that, and, but the big thing was the coaches came back and said, so many athletes were freaking out about the heat. They're nervous. They're they're They didn't know what to do. They're trying to keep themselves cool. They're, They're doing things at last minute. Their athletes, the duck athletes, walked out and were like, I got this. I'm ready for this. And that's and just knowing that they're prepared, knowing that, wow. You know, when we first put people in the heat chamber, the very first, they're like, oh, my God, this is miserable and horrible. I'm like, this is four degrees below what we're expecting, right? So if this feels miserable now, but I don't tell them that, right? But I said, oh, it's just, you know, it's about where it's going to be. Don't worry. We'll get you. And then but by the time they're done, they're like, I got this. I can run in the heat. I can perform in the heat. And that mental benefit is such a huge improvement. To taking the psychological stress away. That's a uh, Keegan Swenson, who is the cross country national champion and now world record holder for Everesting. Everesting he yeah. says that he goes, I love hot races because it breaks mentally weak people. And, but he's got the thing in his brain that it's not going to break him and it's going to break everyone else. So it gives him a psychological advantage, which is just, it's so cool to have that kind of, that's the state of mind of a champion, right? It's like, uh, it's like Belgians being in cold rain. I mean, that, that, that's what they're used to. It's not a shock to their systems at all or their brains. Exactly right. Yep. Yep. And if I can um, uh, regress, digress slightly back to my own race at La Ruta last year or two years ago, uh, 2018, November, 2018, um, I went in there confident on my heat acclimation. Right. And so I, because, even though all the warnings and everybody tells me start slow, start slow, it's, it's much steeper than you think it's going to be. Um, and it's a bloody steep, technically not hard at all race, but, but steep, steep, steep. And, um, did I mention the heat and humidity? Really hot and humid. Um, I went in there a little overconfident, um, and I was not prepared for that level of humidity, um, because in it being much rainier than usual, we ended up carrying our bike for, I think, 10 K through deep mud, um, in the jungle, no movement of air whatsoever. And I went in there and I probably overcooked it, not overcooked it. I went a little faster than I probably should have given the humidity. Um, so I will say that, uh, I learned a lesson, you know, I was very happy to have finished it because I like, didn't want the message being heat acclimation expert comes here and fails because of the heat. Um, so I finished, but I suffered miserably that first day way, way more, um, than I, I should have, um, to the point was on dangerous levels, right? We know that, um, heat stroke is where, um, is the absolutely dangerous heat exhaustion is, is dangerous. Heat is heat stroke can be death. And I was at the point riding where, I was like, am I holding my line? When I go to shift, am I going the right direction every time I shift? And because I, because I was still doing that, I thought, okay, I'm not at heat stroke yet, but I was definitely at heat exhaustion. Hmm. And I'm a heat expert, right? So what, just, would you have, yeah. go ahead. what would you have changed differently to prepare then? More humid work? Um, a little more humid work. I had another a trip to um, uh, Croatia for a scientific thing right beforehand, and that disrupted my heat acclimation protocol a little bit. Um, I would have liked to have had more heat. Um, I should, probably should have started a bit earlier, but I really should have... I would, I was, I was equaling, I was trying to equal what I thought was going to be humidity and what I thought was going to be the temperature. I got the temperature right, humidity, I was off a little bit. The big thing is I had a fan on me while I was doing that and in the, in the chamber while I was working, mm-hmm. uh, exercising. And I didn't expect to be going at a walking pace in deep mud with absolutely no wind whatsoever. I mean, it was just like, you just, it's shocking how hot you get when you, in that, that circumstance. So I think what I would have changed is, is more gradually turn the fan down, 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 had the high humidity up and just got used to grinding out in lower gears and just, like I said before, trying to mimic the conditions, 
Um, I got the conditions wrong a little bit, but more important than that, I went in maybe a little overconfident, thinking here I am, this gringo showing up, and um, most of these people, you know, a lot of them had done Leadville and all kinds of stuff, and they're all like, oh my God, this is so much harder than Leadville, so much worse than this. I'm like, totally different race, you know? <laughs> it's so, so hot. Yeah. So, so really hyper specificity, even though that sounds excessive, it's very much not, especially when you're going into extreme circumstances or extreme conditions. In extreme conditions. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the thing is hard, you know, um, you know, I'm by no means elite, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good cyclist. I've been at it a long time. I do really well in really long, harder races. Um, and I think part of it was, I just got excited at the start and this big climb I went, I should have known better, keep your core temperature low early to get before you get into the deep jungle. Mm -hmm. um, so you're arriving with lower heart uh, body temperature, you're not already on that threshold. By the time I got to the jungle, I was already at the threshold. And, um, you know, you can make up, if you're worried about pacing, then you've got another five, six hours to make up time, right? Yeah. I thought I had to be- this, this pretty closely describes what we'll face at Cape Epic though. So, I mean, the same, same advice applies. I'm sure that we don't ramp up our core temperature, our body temperature too early on because how do you bring it back down? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The advantage you have there is going to be fairly dry. And I think each event, each, isn't each stage only a few hours long? Um, like uh, five and a half, six oh, okay, okay. for the, for the winners. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the first day of La Ruta is longer than that. I think it's um, around 11,000 feet of climbing, and it's all super steep, but it's the heat and humidity. It's only 70, the year I did like 75 miles, um, uh, but it was still, you know, I think the winning times of uh, the locals were outstanding cyclists, cross-country cyclists in, um, in Costa Rica. I think they were like seven, eight hours, something like that. Wow. Uh, I, was also the year, the year, I was also there the year Lance Armstrong did it, and so that made everybody kind of want to be a little more faster at the start to be up near Lance and whatever. And he suffered miserably in that first day of heat, horribly, yeah. right? Um, and so uh, um, he's self-claimed that he doesn't do very well in the heat. Um, uh, Tinker Juarez, who I got to say is like one of the most awesome guys in the entire world, he was there as well and he, he did awesome and he's just approachable and awesome and fun. And, and But great Lance saying he doesn't do well in the heat is really a product of him not preparing for it properly. Yeah. I mean, even though he seems like the, the one guy who would get everything right, I have to believe that even he too could perform well in the heat. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's been his, 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 his experience not being prepared enough for the heat. And therefore he says, I'm not good in the heat. I can tell you, I mean, I've never found it's very rare. Um, and I heard, um, forget the guy's name, sorry, from Precision Hydration talking about this, saying like, had, yeah, exactly, yeah, thank you. Um, he uh, was saying that on rare occasion, he finds somebody who's a really low sweater. But in general, heat I've never seen anyone not get better in the heat through heat acclimation. Everybody has gotten better. It's part of who we are as humans. Um, and it's just a matter of the degree to which they do it and the specificity they get it, and then whether they find that balance between um, like my mistake going out too hard and and overcooking it before I got to the really hard bits. Wow. Uh, so Dr. Minson, my last question for you is what future questions or like areas of research do you want to see around this? Right. Yeah. So the, the areas I'm really excited about really have to do with um, continuing and trying to get more athletes, certainly doing heat acclimation protocols, trying to work out the nuances about what's the best protocol for this and that. Um, how can we use it as a training benefit? So there's been some studies, I think we need to have more of these with bigger numbers, where we have um, athletes are um, uh, doing less total workload, um, but matching the intensity for heart rate. Um, and we're using that now for some um, uh, Australian rules football club teams are doing, I'm doing some work with them and where training load on their legs is so high. So can we minimize the training load on the legs, but get the same performance benefits by doing the heat acclimation. So you have one group that does, does a lot more work, but in cool one that does less work. So, so harder, less stress on the legs, but, but match heart rate intensity more and more data showing that, that, that you get the same performance benefits after a training camp by doing that. Yeah, this group has less overall training load. So they may perform better because they're not as fatigued. We need more people doing that. The area I'm probably most excited about really is the long, extending the heat, heat acclimation in humans to making it more of a regular part of people's training. So they're, you know, for months and months and months are doing two or three days of heat acclimation and seeing if red blood cell mass is increasing. Um, that's an area I think is really exciting. Chad, do you have any more questions? No, I don't. 
Dr. Mintz, we were going to cover three of your studies, one about sweating and then one about heat therapy, but we did one in like almost 90 minutes. So I think we should end it here and hopefully have you back another time. This has been fantastic. I am literally, so I'm going to be in the sauna so much. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we need to buy a bigger <laughs> sauna or a hot tub. <laughs> this is expensive podcast. Thank you. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, please pick the uh, Chris Minson sauna uh, version. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you need to have a signature version. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No one's approached me yet, but, um, thank you both for this. This is awesome. This has been, uh, you know, I get anxious, um, very rarely these days speaking about my research or going to big presentations. I was nervous coming talking to you guys because I respect what you do so much. I, I listen to so many of your podcasts, um, using your workouts indoors and outdoors, and it's, it's made a difference for me and I love it. You guys have a great product. No one's endorsing me to say this. <laughs> really true. I was nervous coming before this one just because you guys are so awesome. And I like you so much. So, so it, it was yeah. a, a true honor having you on here, Dr. Mason, yeah. especially we, considering it is almost poetic in that this was, geez, maybe if not our first, one of our very first podcasts. And we cited your work without even really knowing who we were citing. Right. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, uh, uh, well, you, you cited my uh, colleague, John Halliwell as well. And um, I, he wasn't, he's now, he's now a trainer road user. He's also now a, a, a listen to your podcast all the time. Um, but at the time he, he, I heard you talking about him and you called him out by name. I was like, Oh, you called, they called you out by name. <laughs> I was so jealous. Yeah. The so, only reason I didn't call you out earlier is because I didn't realize that the, the principal investigator was listed last in the study. Otherwise you would have been mentioned far earlier. Oh, it's okay. I'm, I'm not, my ego's not that big, <laughs> more a friendly thing than anything. But, uh, but uh, that said, I am, uh, I am super honored and proud to be uh, the first on this episode. And, and uh, um, it's, you guys just do an awesome job. So, so thanks for having me. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very nice to say. Bye-bye, right, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>